Good afternoon and welcome to Lund University, Sweden, and this seminar, Perspectives on and for Ukraine. My name is Lars Mogensen, I'm a journalist, I'm here to help moderating this event. And before we continue, I'd like to remind you to turn your phones off, the ones of you that, that are in, in the room here. Um, this is an open seminar supporting academic freedom. As you can see in the program here and on your screen, if you're watching this at home or at work, there are ways to donate and to support the Lund University support program for students and staff affected by the situation in Ukraine. Of course, there are other ways to support too. Um, everyone does what he or she thinks is most efficient and, and right. Um, we're here due to one person's, one dictator's decision to start an illegal attack and a fierce, ruthless war on the Ukrainian people. Destroying private homes, schools, theaters, hospitals, attacking nuclear power plants. And so in order for us to somehow expand our knowledge a little bit, get a little bit more of a background to what's going on in Ukraine and the history of, it, of, of, of Ukraine. We've set up a program this afternoon where we have several scholars who will share some of their knowledge and their research on these issues and help us understand. We'll also have voices directly from Kiev today. Um, there, there will also be time for us to reflect a little bit and to listen to music by the Ukrainian composer Vasil Barvinsky and Franz Liszt, performed by the magnificent pianist, musician, Julia Isaacson. So now I give the floor and the microphone to Erik Renström, Vice-Chancellor here at Lund University. Dear colleagues, students and friends. Today, we are all here as world citizens. Free and creative thoughts that can be turned into words or other expressions are the basis of a democratic society. Free and creative thoughts are also the preconditions for renewal. In the light of the past month's dark events, following the invasion of Ukraine, this has become even more important to stress. We now have an ongoing war in Europe. This comes with unimaginable human suffering affecting the civil population of Ukraine. We also have a situation, a world, in which democratic states are threatened and challenged by our authoritarian regimes. This is a threat to our free society as we know it, but it also threatens the university's primary activities. In countries where democracy recedes, there is weakening of the media, the judicial system and academic freedom. And it is therefore important that the world's universities highlight the threat to democracy and freedom in every possible way through any possible channel. All around the world, people are now gathering to show their solidarity with Ukraine. This is good. But the rapid manifestations of solidarity weigh lightly against the hard work that starts now. A free Ukraine has been struck by a hard blow, but it has not died. And it is down to us to ensure that it lives on. Those of us who work at Lund University or other universities all over the world. The academic network is more durable than both political and diplomatic networks. Personal academic connections can and should continue. 
even with non-democratic countries that lack the same degree of freedom as us, but in a prudent and responsible way. Young people of all nationalities who are passionate about a sustainable and democratic society should always be able to rest assured that Lund University, in accordance to its long history of ac academic merit, will continue to admit, welcome, and host students of all nationalities and citizenships. Here, they will obtain both ideas and the strength to put them into action. With this approach, we form a basis for democracy and freedom to prevail. Also on the fertile plains, north of the Black Sea, which many say were the cradle of European civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> now, please, uh, please step up Stefan Storm, composer and professor at Malmo Academy of Music, to introduce our musician and the music that we will be listening to to start with. I will just say a few words about the pieces uh, that we are going to listen to during this program. But first of all, I'm very glad to introduce the pianist Julia Isaksson, who actually was born in Lund and in recent years has studied both in London and in Malmö. In 2019, she graduated from the Royal Academy of Music with first cl class honors now she is studying her second year at the master degree interpretation diploma at Malmö Academy of Music, Lund University, for the pianist Fra Franziska Skog. Julia has per participated in several piano competitions and piano festivals, and she has performed all around Scandinavia, and of course during her time it, at the Royal Academy, she has also performed regularly in London. Julia has also formed a duo with the saxophonist Theo Hillboy, and they recently won the Swedish competition Young and Promising, and they are going on tour next year. She has also received a lot of scholarships from a number of foundations. Julia will perform two pieces this afternoon. First, a piano prelude by the Ukrainian composer Vasil Barvinsky. He was born in 1888 and became one of the leading Ukrainian composers of the 20th century. And he was also an outstanding pianist, musicologist, conductor and pedagogue. From 1915, Barvinsky lived and worked in Lviv. And he was also later on professor and director of the Lviv Conservatory. This was a very productive period for him as a composer, but that en ended abruptly in 1948. That year he was arrested and accused of false folksiness in music. All his manuscripts were burned by the NKVD police in the courtyard of the conservatory, and he was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in a labor camp. After his release in 1958, he worked intensely to reconstruct the works that had been destroyed, but many pieces were forever lost when he died in 1963. Due to the efforts of his fellow musicians in Lviv, he was rehabilitated by the Soviet authorities in 1964, the year after his death. However, until the 1990s, his music was almost completely absent from concert programs. The second piece that will also conclude today's program is Franz Liszt's so-called Dante Sonata, or more properly, after a reading of Dante, a fantasy sonata. It was written in 1849 and included in his second book of Agnès de Pèlerinage, Years of Pilgrimage, which was inspired by Italian culture, landscapes and arts. In this case, the inspiration comes from the one of the cornerstones in the world literature, Dante's The Divine Comedy. The sonata is a massive one-moment piece in 
almost 15 minutes long, and has a special resonance today through its expressive depiction of a journey full of struggles from the inferno, from total darkness and despair, to a vision of hope and newfound optimism. Welcome, Julia.
Julia, Julia Isaacson playing Preludium Number no. 4 by Vasil Barabinsky. Um, I would now like to invite and introduce Anna Isaeva and Per Rödling. Would you please step up? <clears throat> Anna is a story. She's a historian. She's uh, from from Ukraine. She's she's a, a PhD student at Central and Eastern European Studies here at Lund University, and. Um, and uh, you were actually supposed to be in Ukraine now doing yes. research, right? Yes, yes. That's good. It's on, it's on. And we have Per uh, Anders Rudling. I decided to call you just Per. Makes things easier. Uh, Associate Professor of History at Lund University, where he also is um, the leader of, of a project called What's on Ukrainian History, funded by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. So that's sad. Um, Anna, you're from you're from um, in Kiev. Just briefly, what is what are your you have friends and family there? What are what are your personal reflections uh, on what's going on? Yes, so I'm person. I was raised, born, spent my whole life mostly in Kiev, capital of Ukraine. My whole life is there. My whole family is there now, uh, and I was supposed to be there too. Because, like, actually, I'm doing research. My topic here is connected <coughs> with Kyiv, uh, Kyiv in times of First World War and Revolution with ethnic minorities. So, uh, finally, after COVID restrictions, I was about to start to work in archives and just like because of some administrative issues and everything, I came back to. And all the ar archives were closed for, for, for a long time. Yes, yeah. So now it was COVID. time to yes, go back. Yes, time to actually go back to work, and mm. I came back here, and then everything just. Mm. You are waking up at five o'clock in the morning because everything is going on. Mm. Yeah. Are you how are uh, are you in touch with the friends and family every day? Or? Yes, every single day. That's actually so. People who are in. Ukrainians abroad, our for last tw it's 20 days already. Uh, our last 20 days, we live in the regime when you do not sleep at night because you are following news and you are like waiting for calls and you are waiting for first call in the morning. You hear that they are alive and safe, and then you fully sleep a few hours and then you wake up and trying to help somehow. But for, believe me, for majority of people, of Ukrainians who are outside of Ukraine, that's our mode of living for last 20 days. That's, that's how it works. Uh, my family, my friends are, like, they decided, like, majority of them prefer to stay in Kyiv. Uh, because that's their city, they want to, like, why uh, why we should leave, right? We we have lives there, like everything. Every, for example, everything I possess in my life is back there in Kyiv. Everything I earned <laughs> and uh, and yesterday in front of my windows, like uh, pieces of rocket fall down. So maybe, who knows, I will have no place to come back. May, like, but if my family will survive and all my friends, that's, that's the main point. Okay. Um, when we when we look at Ukraine, it's a, it's a young nation. It was independent in 1991, but there was some independence way back too. Could you just give us an update on on Ukraine as an independent nation? Well, the paradox here uh, is that you have two countries at war. Uh, both states became independent when I went to high school. They're about they celebrate the 30 years of independence, arguing. Uh, over a narrative uh, centered around historical references that date back over a thousand years in time and who are the legitimate successor of certain medieval principalities and whatnot. Uh, Ukraine, however, like the Russian Federation, I should say, has never been independent before 1991, depending, of course, how you qualify this. If you consider Kiev and Rus a Ukrainian state, which is the state ideology in Ukraine, but there were attempts at autonomy and independence, an independence movement uh, following the collapse of the Tsarist Empire in 1917. There was Ukrainian People's Republic declared in 1918 and recognized for a couple of weeks by the Germans before it was, they were invaded in 1918. And it was sort of a very brief period of independence at that time. Yeah. If you can call it that, yeah. it was not recognized by many states. But there was an ambition to set up an independent state. 
So when the state came about in 1991, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was poorly prepared for independence. So the economy had been so centralized to Moscow that actually a few hundred bureaucrats in Kiev was administering the economy. And it took almost six years, it took six years, right, until they got the currency, they got the herivna. Uh, when I first went to Ukraine in the 1990s and I exchanged, I remember exchanging 40 US dollars, I literally got a plastic bag full of these coupons and some of them actually lacked serial numbers. There wasn't the know-how to do this. And during this time of, of chaos, you had the beginnings of the formations of, of oligarchies. But even though there were attempts in Ukraine under President Kuchman and under President Yanukovych to establish an autocratic system of government, this diversity has been, I guess, a, I hesitate to call it a blessing in disguise, but as my colleague, the uh, University of Toronto political scientist, Luke and Wei, has a way with words, he, he, he wrote his book called Pluralism by Default. The absence of centralized authority, like in Belarus or Russia, the diversity between various oligarchical groups in Donbass, in Dnipropetrovsk, in, in, in that do not share the same ambitions and have the same sense of direction. You had here this diversity. So Ukraine was adrift, had a quite horrific first few years of independence with inflation of up to 10,000%, very drastic drop in the standard of living, life expectancy, and, and whatnot. But so Ukraine has been uh, and remains poorer than other two Slavic republics. They have a lower human development index. They have a higher head up until last year, scored higher in levels of corruption. But Ukraine is also more pluralistic, more democratic, more open, more tolerant, and has, unlike Ukraine, as a, unlike Belarus, unlike Russia, seen no less than six democratic changes of government. So it's a pluralistic society upon which independence did would you, not... Yeah, would you like to fit in there, Anna? Because yeah. it's, it seems difficult to understand. You have oligarchs, you have corruption, you have you know, economic um, difficulties. But then again, it's more open, it's more pluralistic than some of the other republics. Yes, I would say when, like, when uh, Paris like, is described in Ukraine from outside, I understand it looks probably terrible to live there. <laughs> but as a Ukrainian insider and who actually grew up during this, like, yeah, night is very terrible. But then at the beginning of 2000s, uh, 2000s I would say, like, actually this oligarch, yes, we have oligarch groups. Economy was, uh, was like not uh, was not reformed enough is there a corruption yes it is corruption are there some problems well yes but if you will look back we are 30 years old 30 years old country which got this independence without any experience and without no like examples let's say examples we got were from soviet times from the uh, system of planned economy, you know, where you plan everything, there was no experience of uh, uh, free market. 90s, beginning of 2000, that's the time of like, from, I don't know, popular, popular culture, it's something like Wild West. That's what it looked like. But later, from 2000s, it became to stabilize. There uh, were like more money came into Ukraine, like with investments. More people start to, you know, go abroad and come back with education and expertise. So it, it, I remember, again, as, as a person who grew up there, that life uh, had hope, you know? It was better, better, and better. And again, another absolute part you noticed, like, perfect, got it perfectly. Ukraine may seem, that's what I think main difference and what is very often used by Russian propaganda, that, like, all oh, Ukrainians do not have order or discipline. We are pluralistic, we are very different. Regions are different inside Ukraine, mm. but still we are all in one country, you know, and somehow managed to live b before all. Would you like to fill in, Per? No, I think she's very, uh, Anna is right about this, and what happened in 2004 with the so-called Orange Revolution was that it saw the beginning of mass society, of civic society emerging. The second president of Ukraine, Leonid Kuchma, uh, disgraced himself by ordering a contract murder of a prominent journalist, Gangadze, and was sort of like put in the, in the corner. Uh, mm -hmm. He tried to pass on the, the reign to his chosen successor, at which point civil society really came about. And this sets Ukraine apart from virtually all the other post-Soviet republics, with perhaps the exception of Moldova and, and, and Georgia. But the pluralism, a democracy, and the emerging 
civil society, which is a form of civic nationalism, right? Uh, I mentioned as a discussion we had recently about the, 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 an American political scientist, Michael Billish. He coined the term banal nationalism. The, just the fact that you live in the same state, you, you, the generation now grown up, when they're traveling, they're showing a passport saying Ukraina. If they're into sending letters, they use postage stamps saying Ukraina. If they watch the weather broadcast, they don't get the prognos pagode of the, the weather forecast for the Soviet Union, but you get them for Ukraine. You identify with this new country. So the Soviet references are simply being outgrown in, uh, in a generation which is, just as Anna rightly pointed out, and Anna, um, I'm happy to say, is one of those people that generate this knowledge of the outside world, bring with them knowledge back to Ukraine, and it's really is a thriving, exciting intellectual environment uh, uh, which thrives in, in Ukraine, despite the polarization and whatnot. It's a very, very dynamic country, intellectually, socially, politically very, very different from Russia and Belarus. And I think that many of us remember the, the huge protests at the Maidan Square, the Maidan Revolution in 2014. And you were there, um, I imagine. What did that mean to you? So Maidan, uh, that's main square in Ukraine, probably. And here this lady, that's actually, she stands on the top of main statue in Maidan, in the center of uh, Kiev, capital of Ukraine. So maybe you heard it from the news, right? That was some kind of protests, manifestations, peaceful, which turned into bloodshed in the center of the capital uh, of the city. And again, uh, Ukraine pluralistic with problems, but we never ever before 2014 experienced uh, killings, you know, the, this violence on such a scale, like, for example, Russian Federation with two Chechen wars. For us, like, when we were poor, like, we were poor, yes, we had troubles, but it was common, you know, um, argument in all political decisions that, like, look, at least we divorced with Soviet Union without any bloodshed. Comparing to all other neighbors, that's our, like, main achievement. And then, in the center of the city, during two days, 118 people were killed by police, like uh, protesters without like weapons, and because we don't have, uh, we cannot in Ukraine, we do not have, we cannot possess weapon like without. Anyway, so uh, in those times, uh, I worked in uh, NGO. I spent more than a decade in civil society as a civil society activist, and I worked there. For me personally, it was uh, it's hope. First of all, that's personal choice. I, I like honestly, I will tell you when uh, when I made the decision to go there, I had no hope that we will win, that I will see my parents, like that we will survive. Absolutely no, because but it's human ho like a choice you have to make. It's a choice about being treated as a human being with dignity. It's a choice to to live in free country or at least to try to fight. And uh, it's it's terrible experience because, for example, we uh, like in this. There was a place where we uh, drink coffee with my colleagues each day, and we stored dead bodies there. That's how it was. And after that, when it was done, and uh, our president in those times, president, he probably was I don't know so scared of like uh, uprising on a mass scale that he simply fled the country. Government uh, was there were new elections, and we believe that's the beginning of new life. That's Yanukovych. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned before the the strength of the civil society. Is d did that st st get strength th strengthened even more in starting with Maidan? I would say uh, it's a tricky question because from one side Maidan was not possible without presence of already quite developed, elaborated like civil society, but also many, many, like just to get you an idea, Kyiv is around four million city, right? In the center of the city for two months and a half is situated gigantic camp with people who has to live there, right? So there is a lot of problem with logistics, with sanitation, with hygiene. Da -da -da. Everything were managed by volunteers. So civil society existed, but Maidan events and later annexation of Crimea and war in, the, in eastern of Ukraine get a like, big boost, you know, like gigantic boost to already exist something existing. Mm. Thank you. I'd like to ask Per, uh, if we look at uh, Putin's uh, ambitions, um, he, he regretted the fall of the, the Soviet Union. Is, is his aim now to restore the Soviet Union or what would you say he's, he's aiming at? Well, he presented the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, 
I don't think it was taken very seriously when it announced that I believe in 2007 because there were no shortage of geopolitical and other catastrophes in the 20th century. But to Putin, the Holocaust, World War I, World War II is trumped by the Bielavesha uh, agreement in which Russia voluntarily uh, uh, let the Soviet Union uh, uh, fall apart. Still, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions in this. I mean, Joe Biden made a statement uh, you know, a few days ago, and um, Annie Lerv made a statement, also the leader of the Center Party, saying that Putin aims at restoring the Soviet Union. Well, he does not. Mm -hmm. Putin is radically anti-Soviet. To him, Lenin is the ultimate villain. Uh, it's hard to place Putin on a political sort of right-wing, left-wing scale in the Western uh, sense. He, he belongs to a group that is it's a Swedish uh, Slavist, Magnus Jungren, who talked about the red-brown, a little bit carelessly. But a group of people that are at the extreme right and extreme left at the same time, that glorified Tsar Alexander III and Stalin, the Soviet great power, the KGB, the army, the, the sort of neo imperial tradition, but sees Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and uh, Khrushchev as traitors, right? So he comes from that tradition. So he comes out of a tradition, I wouldn't, don't want to wouldn't want to call it fascist, that, that term is tossed around too, too, mm -hmm. too generously. But there's a tradition there from Alexander Prokhanov, uh, and it's this red-brown group, the, the Chornaya Sotnya, the Black Hundreds. So it comes from a tradition that would feel more comfortable with, with the white generals of World War I, of Wrangel and Denikin and Kolchak, which has been, who has been rehabilitated in Russia. The idea of a one indivisible Russia is really an imperial, neo-imperial project Project, rejecting Lenin, because Lenin believed very firmly, and so did Stalin. They insisted and they fought for Ukraine getting cultural autonomy. And they insisted that Ukraine should not be part of Russia, of the Russian Republic. So Stalin and Lenin, in that sense, uh, are at odds with, with, with Stalin, uh, with, with Putin, so Freudian slip there. Uh, he, would, uh, he would fit rather well with Pabedonosov and right. Alexander III and the, the Black Hundreds of so, the 20th century. And so in that empire that Putin is dreaming of, uh, the city of Kiev, your hometown, is, plays a very special role. Could you just briefly... Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, Kiev, in, uh, Kiev is sacral space, I would say, for Russian propagandists, for Putin, per probably he has some personal feelings towards Kiev, and for historians in general. This is place where actually Ki around Kiev was born first state of Eastern Slavs, right? So-called Kievskaya Rus. About this connection uh, like of Putin ideology and Kievskaya Rus, uh, Professor Oslund will talk a bit later. Kiev is a, a place where uh, Christianity was introduced. First the saints who were Slavs also appeared there. Kiev uh, is a place in, in, like, in this, you know, imperial, imperial ideology. That's a place which, where first, like, Russian state, Russian as Russian Empire was born, and then uh, symbolically, this center of power moved north to Moscow and then to Saint Petersburg. So that's why this place is so, so important to get it, like, to get back. Thank you very much, Anna Isaeva and Per Rudling, for this update. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, hopefully, we're in touch with Oleg Shimansky uh, directly from Kiev. Hello, Oleg. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Loud and clear, thank you. Very, very welcome to your old university. The room is full here and we got people in Sweden and elsewhere w watching. Uh, I'll, I'll just present you Oleg Szymanski. He studied in Lund 2013-2014. He's got a master's degree in entrepreneurship and innovation at the School of Economics and Management here at Lund University. Um, he's experienced in government relations uh, and international cooperation. He runs an international development project um, that, amongst other things, is modernizing and trying to adapt the Ukrainian energy systems to the standards of the European Union. So, Oleg, you're, you're a globalist person. You're, you're um, used to moving around and meeting with people from all around Europe. What is your situation now? Uh, thanks, Lars. Uh, first, I feel that I'm slightly underdressed for the auditorium, uh, so I apologize for that. We like your scarf. 
Thanks. Uh, well, look, uh, um, I think uh, just uh, coming from here, uh, I'm in Kiev. Uh, I live in the left bank of the city, which is mostly residential. And I think uh, it has been uh, slightly less targeted by the rockets uh, than the right bank, where most of the old town and uh, industry is located. Uh, however, over the last couple of days, there were much more, m many more air strikes uh, and uh, air uh, and the rockets hit uh, in the sky. So sometimes, even if the rocket doesn't reach the residential building, uh, the remains of the rocket do, and that of course ignites a fire and, uh, and destroys uh, property. So uh, it, it it's it's not a given that everything's going to be fine. But overall, I think. Uh, Kiev is functioning uh, quite well, uh, although uh, there are roadblocks made of concrete uh, and, you know, these spe uh, specific iron axes uh, to stop tanks on pretty much every street. Uh, we have uh, five bridges to cross the big river that divides the city. And, uh, apologies. And, um, uh, three of them are permanently closed. Uh, only two of them are operating, and uh, one should check which one is working on that particular day. Um, there is a mandatory curfew from uh, 8 p.m. every night to 7 a.m. every morning, so no civilian citizen should should be walked around. Uh, should walk around. Otherwise, uh, the military considers uh, uh, anyone hostile, and uh, of course, that can lead to certain okay, consequences. Yeah. But, and you, uh, your office is closed, uh, and you're an you know, office kind of person, but you're now, uh, you joined a, as a volunteer in a local or regional defense battalion. What do you do? So, uh, as you have correctly said, the uh, Ukrainian government has created the so-called Territorial Defense Forces, which, are consi which consists of different battalions, and these recru recruited amateurs, so not any, you know, anyone could have uh, joined, and these battalions are located at various places around where people actually live. So I'm uh, quite literally helping the battalion that's, that is protecting uh, the place near my house. Uh, and, you know, these people are mostly, I, I talked to a few of them, and uh, th these people are, you know, office workers, uh, you know, IT developers, designers, uh, film crew, and uh, many others. Uh, some of them have um, uh, driven their families to the west of Ukraine and then went back uh, to, uh, to protect it. Uh, then I've uh, met a, uh, a gentleman here who has two sons. Uh, one of them is in the kind of actual regular army, and then he, his other son is in a different battalion and himself is uh, right next to me. And then uh, his um, wife and his mother are taking care of the flat and uh, we, also helping. We, like we talked about the strength of the civic society or the civil society before. And it seems what is happening now during the war, people are getting in touch with each other and, and it changes the way people look at each other, doesn't it? Uh, you're absolutely right, and it's actually it's quite inspiring and uplifting. And uh, the examples include that uh, um, we have organized a group in our residential building of uh, 400 flats, uh, all civilians, of course. Uh, we have bought uh, medical supplies just in case the fire hits. We have found uh, people with first aid training, so we we know uh, who can help. We have positioned uh, fire extinguishers around the residential building uh, and organized 24 uh, seven watch. And it's really, it's really inspiring to work together with these people uh, to take care of our um, location. Let me ask you, we're talking here about scholars at risk and you know, academic freedom. Now the universities are closed, I imagine, all over the country. And you also mentioned to me that this time of the year is the the, the traditional, uh, like the national exam for the the younger people that are aiming to start university, and but and that will not be able either. So what happens to this generation of young students, so to speak, in the academic world? I think it's a very important question because what 
what we've been talking about before and what you mostly see on TV is really the short-term consequence. Of course, this is drastic, uh, that people don't have the place to live, uh, eat, and suffering from bombs, but, but there will be longer-term uh, issues exactly like that. Uh, students in schools, uh, schools are closed across most of the country, except for the Western part, and therefore they won't be able to graduate, they won't be able to enter universities, uh, this fall, and uh, it remains to be seen uh, what uh, would be the impact on these people. Uh, we anticipate that there will be a significant issue with uh, with this generation, essentially, um, and you know, getting through universities, but also getting to the labor market. Okay, um, so we're now here in Lund. We've gathered here with students, staff, experts on this and that, and the vice chancellor, the head of the university. Um, everyone is taken by what's going on in Ukraine, but what would you say? How can, how can people here, institutions or individuals, how can we best help? What can we do now? I think it's uh, about opportunities. Uh, if uh, any, if, uh, you know, Sweden or Lund or other universities can provide uh, scholarships or placements for Ukrainian students, I think that would be very welcome. Um, I have personally experienced the great quality of education and tradition, uh, of course, in Lund. Uh, and I think it would be equally important for students that won't be able, that have uh, escaped from Ukraine for the time being, uh, and it's reported it's over two million, to potentially be able to study elsewhere uh, in while uh, the Russian aggression that is being stopped. Oleg, what are you doing this afternoon and tonight? I'm keeping the watch here uh, on one of uh, Kiev's highways. Keeping watch, huh? With some some of my buddies from the from the territorial defense forces. But you have decided to stay in Kiev. You're not not thinking about leaving. Uh, yeah, I think that other. Uh, I think the Russians should leave because this is our place. This is where we. Uh, that this is where we live, and uh, I think if it's it's our duty to protect it. There is no one else who will stand uh, in our place. Oleg Szymanski in Kiev, thank you very much for participating. Here's an applause for you. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so very much for all your help. Okay, um, we'll head on in this program, and we've talked about history a little bit recently, you know, with the independent state of Ukraine, etc. Um, but I would now like to introduce Mats Ruslund. He's a professor in historical archaeology. Please step up. And um, what Mats is working on is the older history from the Viking Ages and the Middle Ages. His areas. His geographical areas are Eastern Europe, the Baltic countries, uh, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And you have a presentation, Mats. Uh, I read the title. It says, History Remembered, History Forgotten, Chords of Common Memories from Viking Age Kiev. So please give us that. Thank you very much. It all began in a cave in Kiev. <clears throat> In the most famous monastery, Kiev Pechersk Lavra, a monk wrote about past events from the 9th century to his own days in, his, in the 12th. The Rus' primary chronicle is the most important written source on early medieval Rus. And it's very formative for the self-awareness of the Eastern Slavs. But, as all chronicles, the written words carry strong support for one dynasty. It is important to sieve the information through several grids of criticism. When President Putin published his article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians in July 2021, he also omitted the subtleties of historical events. He claimed that in the early Middle Ages, quote, Slavic and other tribes across the vast territory 
were bound together by one language, which we now refer to as Old Russian, and both the nobility and the common people perceived Rus as a common territory, as their homeland." End of quote. With these words, he overemphasized the written sources created by the church and the winning dynasty, the Rurikids, as well as forgot, unfortunately, how other regions in this vast territory and groups there continued to express their cultural entity and uh, their economy. Of course, sources, there are very few and elusive. However, during the last decades, a closer picture has been emerged uh, on the question of Scandinavian East European connections from 700 to 1100 AD. And we're using archaeology and numismatic evidence to compare with all the written sources. We can see, and bear with me now, and come with me on a trip from the 7th century and onwards, uh, that the steps towards these was not, were not so simple as in the words of President Putin. Uh, there were different language groups already from the beginning, playing a decisive role uh, from the early 8th century. And uh, the most important start was when the Baltic Finnic populations invited peers from the Orland Islands and the Lake Melan district to the rich fur trading network in the east. There it started in the northwest. So there is no doubt that Scandinavian warriors and merchants settled in the region. The Scandinavians traveled as far as Baghdad in the beginning of the 9th century, where they were called Ar Rus by the Arabic chroniclers. And in the very beginning, they were perceived as a group living among the Baltic Finns and the Volga Finns and the Turkic people and all the other Volga Bulgars, the immense amount of different language groups situated in the region. After being a mutual project, the fur trade became an economic investment for a larger group of more aggressive Scandinavian adventurers. So from around 900 to the end of that century, to in the, during the 10th century, interaction in the East intensified. The northwest around Novgorod and the southwest around Kiev became a political unit organized under the rule of the Rurikid dynasty with a hybrid population of Slavs, Balts, Finns and Scandinavians as well as other cultural and religious minorities. And from the second part of the 10th century and especially during the 11th century, the Slavic element became influential. Another important observation is that the territory consisted of three different zones of power in the early Middle Ages. There were cultural and economic differences between the Novgorod region in the northwest, around Sustal Vladimir on the middle of Olga, and the fertile and populous southwest. Here, Kiev was established as a town around 900 AD and on the hills by the wide Dnieper River with stone churches that were built. The southwestern region became the most important gateway for Christianization and also Byzantine influence from the south, and especially boosting the East Slavic language through the Orthodox Church. Several marriages between Swedish, Danish and Norwegian royal houses in the 11th and 12th centuries confirm the importance of Kiev and Rus for Scandinavia at this time. After the death of Yaroslav the Wise in 1054, the city was still an important node of trade route to Krakow, Prague and on to Regensburg. And it was also still the most coveted city of all by the princes, princes uh, of the realm, but the unity was lost. A group of them ransacked the city in 1169, which has been unheard of before. The territory was fragmented even further in the end of that century, and finally when the Mongols invaded around 1230. 
even if the Rurikid legacy gave mental and dynasty continuity, the power was transferred to the northeast, where Moscovite Grand Dukes regarded themselves as successors of Kiev and Rus. The homogeneity claimed by President Putin obviously did not exist in medieval Russia or in the medieval ages in, in Rus. Regional differences existed in the territories of the princely towns, especially in the north and east, where Finns and Turkic-speaking nomads were the majority. Within, within the Ruriki dynasty, there existed competition and severe fighting. Fractions and political networks created a fragmentary, fragmented territory with a common major religion in the Orthodox Church. So, if we accept medieval Russia as one cultural and religious whole, we should also define Norway, Denmark and Sweden as one nation because of cultural similarities or historical interactions. The expansion towards the east and beyond the Ural Mountains continued after the Ruriki dynasty had died out, just as the Wild West in North America, Russia had its Wild East, as I quote uh, Professor Christian Gerner, historian. Siberia was drawn into the network from the 16th century AD, but it did not end there. As the most distant fur hunting station, Fort Ross, the small Russian compound north of San Francisco in California, was inhabited from 1812 to 1841. So we can see a progress starting by fur-seeking Scandinavian Svea and Finnic populations in the late 7th century had reached its end in 1867 when Alaska was sold to the United States. When addressing the topic of the emergence of Kiev and Rus, I cut straight into the use of history. My interpretation can, of course, be refuted as any reference to the past. As scholars, we can only reach the actual events and their results to a level of certainty. However, using history to gain power over other nations lead haughty arguments quickly into a quagmire of multiple perspectives, since history is not a straightforward linear chain of events that can be used for contemporary claims. Like many other regions in Europe, Ukraine has gone through steps of development towards shaping a nation. As the historian Christian Gerner also made clear, the Western influences and the Baroque style of the 17th century made an immense impact on Ukraine's cultural life. This diversity cannot be referred to as a weakness when addressing the question of nationhood today. It's a normal development in all European countries. The borders of Sweden have changed with losses and gains, but those delimiting the nation of today are respected by the international society. It is impossible, for instance, to argue that Denmark should include Gotland uh, within its territory, even if the island belonged to that realm from 1361 to 1645 for nearly 300 years. No, the peace signed at Brömsebro is kept and the borders are secure. Just as, as Ukraine's independence since 1991 should be respected. Neither Ukraine's nor Russia's cultural heritage is strange when writing our common history in Scandinavia, even if knowledge about the bonds is they are weak. However, it must be the present population that decides how Ukraine will live and prosper not a force from outside bombing monuments and archaeological sites, the very same heritage that is proclaimed to be uniting them. Even worse, bombing a theater where newborn citizens who have the right to build Ukraine as a democratic notion, nation within Europe. It is not a past that should be used as arguments for nationhood. It is the voices of, the, of the today's Ukrainians. As we began, we will end this crash course in medieval history close to the same cave where we started. A short distance from the Lavra Monastery, the director of the National Museum of the History of Ukraine, Fedir Andrushuk, 
together with his colleagues, are at this very moment rescuing the cultural heritage from being pillaged and destroyed. On the heights above the river Dnieper, close to the Church of the Holy Wisdom, built by Jaroslav the Wise and Ingejad of the Svea, with those fragments representing a mutual history, new interpretations can be made. Without them, the past will forever be lost, and we will be left with mere bedtime stories and propaganda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mats. It's amazing when you hear about all these different cultures and languages that have been linked together through history. Um, we've spoken about scholars at risk and academic freedom before, and now we're about to hear a little bit more about this network that offers sanctuary to researchers under threat. So please step up Pia Silje Klint and Per Svensson. Um, take the stage. Pia is the head of the uh, development office here at the university. Per Svensson is an advisor at, um, a project leader at the uh, London University External Relations Office. So, and you're also the contact person for scholars at risk, right? So please tell us a little bit about, more about your work. You can stay here. So what is Scholars at Risk then? Uh, well, Scholars at Risk is a network made up by more than 560 universities from 42 countries. Lund University is a member of this network since 2014. Uh, it has a small headquarter office at New York University in New York. Um, and there is an even smaller office on Ireland, which is the European office. And serve, the European office, of course, serves the European members. Um, there's also 14 national sections. Uh, which serves the, the national uh, uh, strives. And uh, there we have one section in Sweden. Uh, this section has 24 members. Uh, uh, and um, it was launched... Uh, the, the, the Scholars at Risk Network, it was launched in 2000, so it's about 20 years old. The Swedish section was formed in 2016. Uh, the Swedish section, uh, we exchange experiences on how to host, for instance. We protect scholars. Uh, and this we can do thanks to uh, generous uh, funding from Riksbanken's Jubileums Fund, from um, Formas, and more lately we also received funding from SIDA for hosting uh, people from Afghanistan. Uh, this also brings me to, to uh, extending the perspective somewhat beyond Ukraine. We gather here for the sake of Ukraine, but unfortunately this is not the only armed conflict around the world. This is not the only place where we have scholars at risk. Um, so, Scholars at Risk, what does, what does the network do? It works with protection, advocacy and learning. Protection is to protect, to, mostly to host individuals that cannot pursue their academic activities at home. This is uh, uh, Professor Mohedin Homedi, who was at Lund University for two years, just went back to Syria. Uh, he was at, at Seoul Centrum, uh, Center for Language Studies. 
uh, scholars at risk in total, this academic, last academic year received 1,500 applications. Uh, 1,200 of these came from Afghanistan. So for a normal year before Afghanistan, the, scholar, the network received about three to four hundred, three to four hundred applications. So uh, the number of applications uh, due to the situation in Afghanistan was, was increased radically. Uh, this a past academic year, there has been 315 placements. And in Sweden, we receive about six to seven uh, scholars at risk per year now. Uh, in Lund, we have had one plus one more, so we have two. So the number is not high, but uh, each one of us uh, contribute as a university's member, universities of scholars at risk contribute, and the, the number uh, increases, of course. Uh, the top uh, countries where scholars at risk come, comes from uh, is Afghan this year, Afghanistan, of course, Turkey, Yemen, Myanmar, and Ethiopia. Uh, one might maybe think that it's mainly people working in social science or humanities that are at threat. That is not the case. About 38% is within social science, but then we have within physical and life sciences, 23%, uh, and, and so forth, so on. Um, so this is what I would like to say about protection. Uh, there are many other activities also. I would also like to give some examples of, of how the network works with advocacy and information. Uh, Scholars at Risk has started the, uh, a project that is called the Academic Freedom Monitoring Project. And since uh, 2015, uh, this project publishes annual, an annual report on academic at and attacks on the academic community worldwide. It's called Free to Think. Uh, and in this year, from September 2020 till August 21, they, have, uh, re they report 332 attacks in 65 countries. So it's not only the countries that we may think of. It's in US, it's in, in European countries also. The picture sh shown to the right is, is from, from Kabul University. Uh, and it's just after a, a violent attack by gunmen uh, in November uh, 2020, uh, which left 22 dead and 50 injured students. So these attacks, which causes killings, violence, imprisonment, prosecution, uh, some of the reports are also travel restrictions, but, but these attacks, they are carried out by both state and non-state actors, including armed militant and extremist groups, police and military forces, government authorities, off-campus groups, for instance. They result in, in, in deaths, in injuries, and deprivation of liberty. Of course, it harms the individuals and the institutions that are directly targeted, but it also undermines the entire higher education system. But of course, by impairing teaching research and constricting the space to think, question and share ideas. But also, ultimately, it impacts all of us uh, by damaging the higher ed education uh, the unique capacity of higher education to understand, explain, and improve our world and the human condition. And thereby also, of course, to drive social, political, and cultural and economic development. I will just show uh, a second activity that Scholars at Risk is involved in. And this is the uh, Academic Freedom Index, which they have developed together with 
the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin and with the v uh, Varieties of Democracy Institute at Gothenburg University. This builds on, on um, uh, uh, five expert coded indicators which captures the element of in de facto realization of academic freedom. And it's freedom of research and teach, freedom of academic exchange and dissemination, institutional autonomy, campus integrity, and freedom of academic and cultural expression. Uh, the last year, uh, there has been around little more than 2,000 uh, 2, country experts, uh, which have covered uh, 175 countries. And I just show one example here. Before I show you, uh, comment a little bit on this, I'll just mention that all these five parameters has been decreasing uh, from year 2000 till 2020. So the space for academic activities has decreased. We see, uh, uh, now this is not a pointer, but <laughs> we can see a slight drop in the blue line, the European line, the, the average for Europe. It's dropping slightly towards, uh, towards 2015, 2020. The red line is Russia, has a boost between 1990 and about 2000. From, Gen from 2000, uh, you know who became the president. Uh, uh, so Putin came into power. Uh, if there's a link, uh, uh, one may think. But, uh, it's happened at least co uh, at the same time. Ukraine, the green line, decreases sharply around 2014. Maybe it has something to do with the annexation of, of Crimea, or uh, at least it uh, happens uh, at the same time. This is, of course, uh, uh, a good instrument for, for research, but it also to, to inform policy debates and also for uh, universities in, in choosing partners, perhaps. Now I have extended the perspective, but let's, let's turn back to Ukraine. Uh, this is a picture of um, the faculty of management and uh, social science at uh, uh, Kharkiv University in the east of Ukraine. This morning we heard on the news that it's uh, not entirely surrounded yet. This picture was taken a little bit more than one week ago. Uh, as you know, there are uh, about three million refugees. Uh, the main recipient today is Poland, uh, although not all of them stay in Poland. The, the sector, the higher ed education and research sector, is approximately the, uh, of the same size as uh, Sweden. 46% women, which is interesting now when, when, when um, it's uh, only women that uh, leave the country together with children and, and of course, and, and elderly. So, uh, so far, Scholars at Risk has received only about 30, 3 zero applications from uh, Ukrainian scientists. This is, of course, <laughs> nothing with the need with that we foresee. Um, but uh, it may be a sign that, that people first think of the security before they think of what to do uh, with their lives. We foresee a, a large need in the future. And the response from the sector, as you, many of you know, it has been statements of solidarity and condemnation uh, from EU, the European University Association, um, the Swedish... Um, Association of the Association of Swedish Higher Education Institution, SUHOF, and others. Uh, there has been nat nationally uh, funding initiatives for students and researchers from Ukraine throughout Europe. 
in Sweden, we don't have any national uh, program, support program yet, we hope. Uh, Scholars at Risk is, is currently trying to uh, explore possibilities together with funders um, to set up such a program. Uh, we have uh, put our collaboration with Russian institutions and Belarusian institutions on hold. Uh, of course, this is uh, not uh, restricting uh, individuals from those countries. Uh, and there is also starting to come several initiatives, like the one called Science for Ukraine, if you Google on Science for Ukraine. It's a, a, a site where you can add uh, positions, uh, other types of support. So it's a quick way of, of displaying different uh, support. In Sweden, uh, we have so far seen funding from uh, uh, the, the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research, Royal Swedish Academy of Science, and the Wallenberg Foundations. Uh, we are freezing the collaboration with Russian institutions, um, the Association of Swedish Higher Education Institutions, uh, are currently mapping challenges, and they are going to reopen the advisory group for refugee issues, which was initiated during the Syrian crisis. Uh, as I said, Scholars at Risk Sweden, we are in dialogue with, with many actors currently, uh, also with the Minister of Education, with SIDA, they, uh, the, the BR, so the Swedish Research Council, Swedish Institutes, etc. Luckily, uh, we received news the day before yesterday that uh, Ukraine students um, will not need to pay study fees, but they cannot take study loans. So we also need local initiatives. We need national initiatives to support, but we also need local initiatives. Um, and this is the message from, from Scholars at Risk headquarters in New York, that Scholars at Risk cannot uh, cater for the needs, of course. So we need national in initiatives, but we also need local initiatives. Isn't it that so, Pia? That's exactly so. And uh, Per Svensson's story is a perfect uh, backdrop uh, of a problem that we are addressing here today and what we absolutely have to do. As you have heard, and as you understand, due to the catastrophic situation in Ukraine, there is a huge need to gather financial resources in higher education. Lund University can help. Today, we launched the financing of the Lund University support programs for students and staff affected by the situation in Ukraine. And you can help as well. You as an individual, you as a foundation, you as a company, and you as an organization. Every contribution is important, regardless of size, and each of us can support. This time, we can really change the life, uh, change people's lives. If we have the financial means, we can act rapidly. We can create a safe place for staff and students, for researchers, and allow them to continue their work and their studies here at Lund University. If you wish to contribute, you can use the switch number or the bank euro that was shown in the first slide. I hope we will get them back later. This program will be open for support from now on. This is an opportunity for us to build bridges and knowledge under the umbrella of free academia and democracy. Donation make a difference for those who receive money, of course, but also for those who give. Development Office 
helps donors to create impact through Lund University. By those words, I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pia C.D. Clint and Per Svensson, and the um, accounts and the numbers are on the, on the screen. Uh, I hope this has been an, a useful afternoon for you. Uh, it's difficult to take in all the atrocities, the terrible news that come from Ukraine. It's a lot worse for the people that are there, like Oleg. Um, but in order to somehow sum up this afternoon and to and to look ahead, we've invited Jöran Rosenberg, a very f well known, famous Swedish writer, author, and journalist, to, to try to give a, a closing speech. Um, one of Jöran's most read and widely translated books is A Brief Stop on the Road from Auschwitz. And his latest book is titled Rabbi Marcus Ehrenpreis, Ubesvorade Scherleck, Rabbi er Marcus Ehrenpreis unanswered love. Joran, please step up. <clears throat> well, thanks for, for the honor to do this and to be here. Uh, I have to say uh, I have uh, slept little lately, uh, not only because I knew I would stand here, but these have been difficult times f for a person like me who is sort of have been absorbed in in the in the, in events like a journalist also perhaps because of my history my european history this awakens really devils in me what happens now someone said there are decades in which nothing happens and there are weeks in which decades happen. I have to say that the man who said it was Lenin. And on this, I think he knew what he was talking about. A time of revolution, of rapid change, of unforeseeable uh, changes in, in politics and in Europe. I would say that we are in such a time now, and it's very hard to to speak because there is so little one can say, one can only see and absorb what is going on, but the effects on all of us, we don't know yet. And I think we are not really taking this in, what it might mean. But one thing I would say, and this is really comes out of all this and mainly out of the the brave struggle of Ukraine and the Ukrainians at this moment. And it's the term freedom. It has suddenly taken on a new dimension, or rather taken on its deeper existential dimension. That freedom which is so innately human, which consists in our ability to, and capacity to choose, what we think and what we do. Or in the inner sense that we have such a choice, that we are convinced we can do that, that the course of life is not predetermined, that it's not imposed on us by a force or a destiny that we cannot influence by our choice of action and thinking. Even when a choice seems difficult and perhaps sometimes impossible, we know it's there. Even in a prison, your spirit can remain free, which to me is the ability to imagine a choice. Even in Auschwitz, under the most difficult circumstances, some people managed to remain free in that very sense. They were killed, but they remained free souls. Freedom as opposed to the dictatorship of what has to be. Freedom as a spiritual resistance movement. Freedom as resistance to the notion that might is right. 
Freedom as resistance to a state of being, which the Greek historian Thucydides described 2,500 years ago. The strong do what they can, the weak endure what they must. A word that we perhaps thought that we had left behind. Well, freedom is not an absolute, you know all that, we all know that. My freedom can infringe on yours, etc. If freedom is about choice, so one choice may hamper another. We all know that too, of course. Freedom is not a fixed state of being. I don't think it's a state of being at all. I think it's a value, a human value we may choose to live by. It's not the only value we human may live by. We also live by the value of human life and by the value of safety and security. And sometimes these values may clash and we must compromise. But the war on Ukraine has made it shockingly clear, at least to me, that there might be a point where no compromise is possible. Since what is at stake is freedom as an existential human value, a value on which our existence as free human beings depends. I think Anna Isayeva phrased it that clearly when she spoke about her choices at the present in her life. It's a choice you have to make. In this, they are of course the Ukrainians, Ukraina, fighting and dying for whatever we mean by academic freedom. Since the value of academic freedom is intrinsically linked to the value of truth and the ethical position of truth seeking. And in this war, this is what is at stake. Or as the writer Arthur Kessler wrote in the midst of another war, the Second World War, he wrote, in this war, we are fighting against a total lie in the name of a half-truth. And I think this is true for this war as well. In this war, a total lie, resorting to, to totalitarian means, has gone to war not only with Ukraine, but with everything that the Europe we still live in stands for and builds on. And it is this Europe with all its half-truth, conflicts and frustrations, and the academic world is no exception to that, we know, that we must muster the strength and the courage to defend. In this, I think, there can be no compromise, no ambiguity. The total lie and the half-truth, that's what we have. A world in which a total lie succeeds by physical violence and by what I would term Verbal violence, propaganda, lies, slander, is a word in which there can be no academic freedom as well. The value of academic freedom is intrinsically linked to the prevalence of the value of truth. Or as Michael Polanyi, scientist, once put it, science can only flourish when scientists have the liberty to pursue truth as an end in itself. We have seen it coming for some time, a world where total lies are spreading, rapidly undermining the value of truth and truthfulness, and thus the value of freedom. We saw it happen in Trump's America, and it can happen again. And what happens in America or Europe may depend on the outcome of this war. What we now witness is a total lie armed with nuclear weapons going to war against the most glaring facts and truth. In the most Orwellian newspeak, Putin is turning black to white, war to peace, lie to truth, mass murder to a rescue operation, a Jewish-born president to a Nazi. Hitler and Stalin would be proud of Putin. However, let's not forget that the very notion of academic freedom and perhaps the value of freedom as such also has its roots in what we may call the Western civilization. Not only there, 
but to a significant degree. The university is arguably a Western creation. When we for good reason criticize and oppose and investigate the history and deeds of this civilization, we are acting upon ideas and ideals that have evolved within it. It is full of half-truth for sure, and hypocrisy certainly, but it aspires not to be a total lie. It aspires to truth-seeking, it aspires to self-examination, it aspires to a never-ending human quest for knowledge and understanding. This seminar, I believe, has shown that we are all becoming aware of what is at stake here. If a total lie is allowed to win in Ukraine, or rather if a total lie cannot be defeated in Ukraine, if brutal might is allowed to be proven right in the very midst of Europe, then we might all find ourselves in a world in which matter has vanquished spirit, as a rabbi I have just written a book about used to say. Or more straightforwardly, where brutal material force will determine who we are and what we can become. I'm convinced that this will not happen. I believe with my rabbi that the human spirit will vanquish matter. And this is why the cause of Ukraine must be the cause of all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jöran. Thank you so much. Um, we will end this afternoon, this seminar, again with music performed by Julia Isaksson, now Franz Liszt. And uh, after that, downstairs in the Pela Salen, there will be a chance for you to talk to each other. There will be some drinks and some food. Uh, but we will end this here now with Julia and Franz Liszt, please.